Hi everybody, welcome again to this course on modern optimization. In this video today, we shall start introducing how optimization works. We shall start off with one of the most famous optimization methods that is called the gradient descent. We shall cover some of its theory and also go through its implementation. This will require you to go through some maths, but if you do not understand everything, do not worry. Okay. The, the rest of the course does not depend on a deep understanding of gradient descent. However, some understanding will help you differentiate between mathematical optimization and modern optimization. Also, it helps you know why uh, this algorithm is so popular, uh, regardless of whether you're going to use it or not. Okay, so let's move on. So this is a slide from our previous lecture that showed why optimization is such a challenging proposition. You can review uh, the last video to see details of these challenges, but today we shall focus on the second objective, which is how to search and get better. So how to search? That is, if we have to find a better solution to our problem, which direction should we move in? We shall seek some inspiration from basic college level maths here. Remember we said today we should discuss gradient descent. Now gradient descent relies on the mathematical concept of slope or gradient of a function. So let's see some examples. Suppose we have an xy plane with some points on it. Now what do these points represent? Well, it appears that they all lie on a straight line. And say it turns out that the formula for this line is y equals 2 times x. Notice the slope of this line is upwards. This shows that as x increases, y increases as well. This means that y changes positively with a change in x. So the slope or the gradient as we call it is positive. Next consider a downward slope. Now pause and verify that as x increases y decreases. This means that y changes negatively with a change in x. So the slope or the gradient is negative. Consider now y equals 2 plus 2x. So this simply adds a constant 2 to our previous function y equals 2x. Therefore this function as you can see from the plot as well is elevated above y equals 2x. But what about the gradient or its slope? Is it the same as y equals 2x or is it different? Well, I hope you agree that the gradient of the two functions is the same because you can see the top two lines are parallel to each other, so hence their slopes must be the same. So simply adding the constant value 2 did not change the slope or the gradient. Next consider another function that adds 10 to a previous function y equals minus 2x. This elevates y equals minus 2x along the y-axis. Again, the gradient or the slope does not change by adding a constant value 10. But the question is, can we measure the exact value of the gradient? The answer is yes. The gradient of a function is simply its derivative, that is dy by dx. Sometimes we call it y prime as well or y dash. So some basic school level calculus will remind you that the gradients of the functions above, the four functions that are for whom the, the four equations are given above. Um, so their, their gradients are 2 for positive slopes and minus 2 for negative slopes. As we said earlier, adding constants does not change the gradients. So 2 and minus 2 are the constant values of slopes here. 
So because the slopes are either 2 for the positive uh, slopes uh, or minus 2 for the negative slopes, and in either case because they are constant, uh, this means that the slopes or gradients are not changing, okay, as 2 is a constant value, minus 2 is a constant value. So in either, in either case, the, the slopes are not changes, they are not changing. This makes sense because we can see from the plots that the slopes of the function do not change, you know, they stay the same. But that is not always the case. For instance, consider another function y equals minus x square. Watch its graph as well and decide if its slope is constant. Now, if you are mathematically oriented and you want to see what its gradient is, you can take its gradient. You can take its uh, derivative. And this time, the derivative produces not a constant, but another function that is minus 2 times x. So because the gradient itself is now a function, that indicates that the slope is not constant, but it varies. For example, the function reaches its maximum value when x equals 0, 0.0. So this is represented by the flat line right at the top of this function. And you can see for yourself that the top point of this function corresponds to x equals 0, 0.0. So uh, at x equals 0, 0.0, there's a flat line, like I said. Now, what is the slope of a flat line? I hope you agree that the slope of a flat line is exactly 0. But if we measure the slope somewhere in the left half of the picture, then the slope is positive or upwards because the function is increasing in the left half, that is for all the values of x below 0, 0.0. However, if we measure the slope of any point in the right half of the picture, that is for all values of x that are greater than 0, then the slope or the gradient is negative. And that makes sense because the function is decreasing. Now here's a little challenge for you. Can you compute the exact values of gradients at x equals negative 0.5, x equals 0, and x equals 0.5? Notice you know that y dash or y prime that computes the gradient is represented by a function that is minus 2 times x as shown on this slide. So you must simply substitute three values of x to compute the gradient. Give your answers below the video. Now suppose your task is to find the maximum value of this function in the plot, uh, in the lower plot. Suppose you cannot see this plot, but you do know the present value of x, and you can compute the value of gradient at the present value as well. Can you come up with a search strategy to move to higher values of the function that is y equals minus 2x squared. So suppose x equals negative 0.5. So I'm just going to give you a hint as to how to build a search strategy. So you know, so so x equals uh, negative 0.5, that is in the, it is in the negative, uh, in the left half of the picture. So where to move next? To do that, let's compute the gradient at x minus at x equals minus 0.5. Uh, and if you've done the challenge, you know that the gradient at that value is just 1. Now, if you add the two together, that is the present value of x with the present value of its gradient at that value of x, then which way are you heading? Well, the present value of x is negative 0.5 and the present value of the gradient at that value of x is just plus 1. So minus 0 0.5 plus 1 gives you 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 is in the right half of this picture, x equals 0 0.5. So 
when we jump from x equals negative 0.5 to x equals plus 0.5, we actually did move towards the maximum value of the function, but we actually crossed it when we landed at x equals 0.5. So yeah, we didn't exactly find the maximum, but at least gives us a hint that adding the gradient moves you towards the maximum value, though you may cross it. Now that you are at x equals 0.5, to get you to the maximum, you need to move to the left. So. Again, you compute the gradient, which is now negative 1. And you add this gradient to the present value of x, which is now positive 0.5. And so the new value of x will then be negative 0.5. So again, you moved back to the maximum value, but you jumped over it. But regardless, we can at least see that adding the gradient moves us towards the maximum value, but to land at the maximum, we may have to make our jumps smaller. We shall return to it. Likewise, when our task is to find the minimum value, what strategy do we adopt? Well, if adding the gradient moves us towards the maximum, then intuitively we can think that subtracting the gradient will take us away from the maximum and towards the minimum. Well, the two strategies that we presented in the last slide make what is known as the famous gradient ascent or the gradient descent function. When we have to find the maximum value of a function, we are ascending, so we use gradient ascent. This simply means that if fx is a function of our interest and xi is the present value of x, then to find its next value, that is xi plus 1, we simply compute the gradient of our function at the present value of x and add this gradient to the present value of x, which is xi. The gradient is computed by taking the derivative of the function and it is also represented by f dash or f prime here. So for example, if xi equals 0 0.5 and fx and f dash x are as on the screen, then we can compute xi plus 1 by simply substituting the values. So the next value of x becomes negative 0.5. So we jump from 0.5 to negative 0.5. Now, if we want to find the next value of xi again, then we repeat the process. Can you hazard a guess as to what would be the, 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 the next value of x then? Well, if you compute, you'll find that we are back to 0.5 and which is where we started from. So it looks like we are jumping back and forth around the maximum, but not really getting to the maximum. And that is the situation that we discussed in the last slide as well. Likewise, we can get gradient descent if we are looking for the minimum value of a function. In this case, we simply subtract the gradient at each time instead of adding it. But the problem is that we need to adjust the size of our jump. Otherwise, we can jump over the maximum or the minimum. So to do that, instead of adding the entire gradient f dash x as is, we add a fraction of this gradient. Hence, we multiply the gradient f dash x with a fraction that is represented by alpha. Alpha is also called the learning rate. So the, there's a question for you. If x is already at the maximum or the minimum of a function and we apply gradient descent, the next step of gradient descent, what will be the next value that is the value of xi plus 1? You can use the pictures on screen to get an intuition about it. Think what is the value of gra gradient at maximum or minimum of a function. Write your answers down in the comments below. Okay, I can give you a hint that the next value will be the same as the previous one, but you need to figure out why. 
So far, we discussed a very simple form of gradient descent or ascent where there was only a single variable x. Often, the real problems involve multiple variables. For example, profitability of a company depends on many variables. While prof profitability is a complicated function, here let's consider a simple mathematical function of two variables. So consider the function f as on your screens. We write f of x1 comma x2 and that means to compute f we require values of two variables that we call x1 and x2. And the function is computed by taking the square of x1 and a cube of x2. Now we can also combine both x1 and x2 into a vector. So we say our input variable x is now a vector with two components, that is x1 and x2. The arrow on top of x means x is a vector. Notice the notation for the derivative will also change now. So the derivative f prime or f dash is rewritten uh, as an inverted triangle next to f. And this means that the derivative will also be a vector with as many components as the components of vector x. So the vector of derivatives contains a couple of partial derivatives with respect to the two variables x1 and x2. And they equate to 2x1 and 3 times x2 square. So the bottom line is when dealing with multiple variables, the gradient also contains multiple components. Now, how do we conduct the gradient descent or gradient descent? That is, how do we compute the next value of the input variable x, where x is now a vector? So now we shall have to compute the next values of each input variable or each component of the vector x. So for, so for x1, let's denote its next value as x1 i plus 1. And this equals x1 i plus alpha, which is the learning rate, times the partial derivative of the function with, res with respect to just x1. So essentially it is the same computation as before, except that we are now using partial derivatives. Similarly, we can repeat the process for x2 and for as many variables as are present in our problem. Note, just like we combined multiple variables above into a vector, we can still do the same. So all the next values of the variable, that is x1, i plus 1, x2, i plus 1, and so on, can be combined into a single vector called x of i plus 1. Likewise, the previous values can also be combined. And the partial derivatives can be combined as well. Notice we did not need to combine alpha because alpha stays the same for every variable. So there are no different values to be combined into a vector. Hence, we can rewrite the multiple equations above in a condensed vectorial form. That is, we'll use a vector notation as appears on your screens. This one shows gradient ascent where we add the gradient. And the next one shows the more popularly used term, that is gradient descent, where we minimize the function, so we subtract the gradient. Note, however, that computationally, this condensed expression does not mean that we implement gradient descent or gradient ascent any differently now. In fact, all the steps above in the equations given are still needed. However, in writing, the vectorized or the, or the condensed form is more convenient. So if you're dazed by maths, do not be so. 
Gradient descent comes pre-implemented in various libraries. For example, if you use neural networks, you do not even need to know that it is working behind the scenes. But being such a fundamental method, it is important to understand it. So here is a summary of the method. To start the method, we pick a starting value of our solution, that is the variable x. If there are multiple variables, we choose values for all of them. That is why x is represented as a vector, even here. Thereafter, we, uh, we repeatedly calculate new values of the variable or variables by adding or subtracting gradient values, depending on whether you are maximizing or minimizing, until you are satisfied with the quality of the solution achieved or you think enough time has elapsed. And you return to the and you return the final value of the variable. A question arises as to how we know that we have reached the best solution close to the space in which we are exploring. Well, as the graph on the screen shows that when the function is at any extreme, that is, the function achieves a maximum value in, uh, within a certain locality or the minimum value, then in both the cases, the slope is zero. So when we detect a slope zero, we sort of, sort of you know, take a guess that, you know, we may be at a maximum or the minimum value. For the multi-dimensional multi cases, the magnitude uh, the, the, of the gradient is computed as on your screens. And it's basically the sum of the squared partial derivatives computed at the present values of xi. Okay. And again, <clears throat> this magnitude also turns out to be zero if we have reached close to uh, a, a maximum or a minimum value. Again, if you found some of the maths daunting, you can brush up by consulting calculus textbooks. But if you're not interested, that's okay, because in here, you need to get an idea of simply what gradient descent does. For example, uh, an issue with gradient descent is that if the gradient is not zero, simply a maximum minimum, uh, sorry, the issue with gradient descent is that uh, gradient is uh, not zero only on maximum or minimum values, but it can happen at some in-between point too. So as on your screen, such a point is called a saddle point. So if the gradient descent can stop here, suggesting that this is the best point in a local neighborhood, it actually isn't. So you could be deceived. Another issue is that gradient descent may take many steps to converge to the desired solution. For example, earlier we saw that by adding gradient, we can bounce around the desired solution. And this picture shows that again. Here, adding gradient jumps from the, the old value of x to the new value of x, okay? Uh, but adding gradient again jumps back to the old value of x. To avoid that, we have mentioned before that we can use a small value of alpha, but always using a small value of alpha is not always appropriate because sometimes that means that it will take us a long time to converge. By converge, I mean to get to, to a solution that is acceptable or get, getting to a slope that is zero. So we really need to find the right value of alpha. And, you know, finding the right value of alpha can be a challenging proposition, as you can imagine. Another problem is that gradient descent can only find a solution in a local neighborhood. For example, in this last picture, if our starting value of x is somewhere in the extreme right, then successive iterations of gradient descent may reach only the top of the smaller peak but it cannot jump over to the bigger peak. Now you must convince yourself why that is the case. Also think that what you can do to avoid that. Let me give you a hint how to, on how to avoid. How about running gradient descent multiple times with a different starting point each time? 
Now let me introduce a problem where gradient descent is often used. This problem is called regression. Suppose we have some sample values of x and for those value of x, we also have the output values of some function f of x. But we do not really know what that f of x is. In other words, we do not know the formal, the, the real formula of f of x that generated these values. We can plot these points and see a relationship between x and the output values of f of x. Uh, so the output value of f of x are plotted along the y-axis. Okay? So we can also call them y values. Now our problem is that we have to discover the function or the mathematical formula that you know, if we draw that formula, that uh, the drawing of that formula or the curve or the line that it produce, it will go through these points. Okay, we call that it, that the formula will fit these points. So fitting a formula onto a set of given points is called a regression. In regression, it is deemed okay to find a formula or find a function that even if it does not perfectly fit these points, can at least approximate the points. And this approximating function is represented by y hat as on your screens, or as on your screens. But still, what is y hat? So say somebody gives us a hint. The hint says that the true f of x that generated the y values may be approximately equal to the function on your screens in red. You can substitute the values of i, uh, sorry, substitute the values of x in this function to find the values of f of x, but there is still a problem. And that problem is that we do not know the value of the Greek letter beta that appears in boldface. Clearly, if we set different values of beta, that will generate many different kinds of functions. And this is why beta is called a parameter of the function f of x. Okay, x itself is, is uh, the variable, but beta is what we have to figure out, and therefore it is the parameter of the function. Now, our problem in regression is to find the best value of beta, so that when we substitute that ideal value of beta, we can reproduce the values of f of x as appear on your slide, you know, all the bunch of numbers on top. So this problem is called the parameter optimization problem as well. Now notice the exponent of beta in this expression in the red is one, okay? Or the power of beta is one. When this is the case, and we have to find out the value of the parameter beta, okay, then we say that the parameter is a linear parameter. And to find the values of linear parameters, we can use a well-known well -known statistical technique called linear regression. Linear regression is often taught in courses on applied statistics, and it works very well. However, sometimes we have to find parameters that are non-linear. For example, suppose our hint changed to this expression on your screens now. Now here, beta is enclosed within a squared quantity. So the exponent of beta or the power of beta is no longer one. So when the power of something is not one, it is called nonlinear. So because beta is the parameter of this function, and it is non-linear, so we call that beta is a non-linear parameter. And finding the best value of beta, where the power of beta is not one, is called a non-linear parameter optimization. Now, what does it mean to find the best value of beta? Well, it means that if we can substitute that value in, instead of beta, then the difference between the ideal y values that we saw on the last slide and that were represented by f of x and the values generated by computing the function in red must be almost zero. 
That difference is often called the error between the ideal values and our approximating function, which is represented in the red. Now, in optimization, we often do deal with the squared error instead of simply uh, the error. So we simply square both sides. And finally, remember, we have to compute the error on not just a single value of the input variable x, but for all its values. So we sum up the squared errors for all the different values of the variable x. Hence, I have replaced x with xi. Note xi here in this slide simply reflects the ith value of x in the data set. And it does not represent a new variable. The Greek letter sigma at the start of the expression at the bottom of the slide shows that we are summing all the squared errors here. Then we divide the sum of the squared errors by n, where n is the number of values of xy pairs in our data set that we showed on the last slide. By dividing by n, we get the average or the mean of the squared error. This is a very popular error measure in optimization and in machine learning, and it is often abbreviated as MSE, or mean squared error. Note the mean squared error, or the MSC, varies by varying the values of the parameter beta. Hence, I have plotted the MSC over different values of beta. And here, I repeat the definition of MSC from the last slide. Obviously, we want to minimize the MSC. Hence, we have a minimization problem. So mathematically, we can write the minimization problem as is appearing on your screens, where the use of the min notation shows that we want to minimize the MSC, and we want to do so by finding different values of beta. Therefore, beta appears under min. To do that, we can employ gradient descent. And that means we start off with a guess value of beta that we call beta i, and we subtract the gradient from beta i to find the next value of beta, and that is beta i plus 1. But the next question is, what is the gradient? Well, the gradient is simply the derivative of MSC with respect to beta. Hence, we compute that and show the results on your screen. Now we have everything to write a simple piece of code that can implement gradient descent for this problem. Uh, but before you go off and try to implement this problem, notice how gradient increases sharply as we move away from beta equals 2 in the figure. Think about its consequences. Think what will happen if we initially guessed beta to be far, far away from the, from the ideal value of 2. How big the magnitude of the gradient will be there. Notice for a, for a straight line, for a vertical line that's going straight up, the gradient is infinite. So this graph, as we move away from beta equals 2, you notice, is also rising very steeply. So the values of the gradient will probably be massive as well. So it could be that the gradient values are become so big that even our computers are unable to compute it there. So what will happen then? Will you be able to run gradient descent in that case? Notice we earlier said that one of the problems with gradient descent or ascent is that, the, that it does not always find the best solution. For example, Consider maximization problems on your screens. If we start from the extreme right, it may simply climb the first peak and then not move from there. Hence, we say gradient descent can get stuck uh, at a point that is optimal, but optimal only in a small locality. Hence, this optimum point is called the local optimum. This is why gradient descent is also called a local optimization algorithm. However, we can apply a trick to make it sort of a global optimization algorithm. So to do that, if we restart gradient descent from a new starting point, 
after it gets stuck into a local optimum, we may be able to find a global optimum. Hence, we can convert gradient descent into a global optimizer. So here we show an algorithm for converting gradient descent into a global optimizer. First off, set the best value found so far to some horrible value because we haven't even started doing gradient descent. So let's suppose we have a horrible solution at hand. So if it is a minimization problem, set the best to some really high value. Next, choose a starting guess for x. Say we choose a random value. Starting with that value of x, run gradient descent until we run out of maximum time allowed. Or gradient descent converges, that is, the gradient is almost zero. Then we check if the solution found is better than the best we previously had. And if it is so, then we update the best. And then we go back to step two. Set another random value of x and restart. So this is a simple trick to run gradient descent a few times and hope that we can find the best value. However, as we shall see in the next video, it is still not foolproof. In the meantime, you can think yourself why that is so. Nevertheless, you have a trick up your sleeves, so try it, read around about gradient descent, and we shall see you in the next video. Bye.